Uh, good morning, church. Okay, well, the past uh, few weeks we have been going through uh, entire books of the Bible, entire books of the Old Testament, to talk about how they point forward to Jesus. Not just one passage in them, not just one little part, one little mention, a little Jesus Easter egg um, in, in the text of Scripture, but the whole thing points towards Him. In fact, He shows up in the Gospel of John. He talks to, uh, uh, talks to a group of people, and He says, You search the Scriptures... Because in, you think that in them you have life, but it is they that point to me, and yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This, the whole Bible is about Jesus. It points to him. It's not a story about us and what we must do. It's a story about him and what he has done. Amen? Amen. And so in Christmas time, we remember, we celebrate the anniversary of when God came into the world. God became a man, um, became flesh was born, became a baby, and he came and he walked this earth and he did what you and I could not do. He lived a right, perfectly righteous, holy life without any errors. He, he lived the life that we should have lived. And then that manger that he was born in as a baby, God become a, 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 a baby, uh, become a man just like us, that manger pointed forward to the cross where not only was God born for us, but then God died for us. He took our sin to the cross and he nailed it to the cross and he put our sin to death and then he was buried and he rose again and he, as he rose again, his victory was imputed, uh, the Bible says, given over to us, counted as if it's ours and Jesus' victory that started all the way in the manger in the story of Christmas led up to his victory that's been given to us. Not because we have earned it, but because he has earned it and he has given it, given it freely to us. And so we remember the Son of God, born from the line of David. God become a man, born in Bethlehem. And the book that that prophecy appears in, that the Messiah, the promised deliverer, will be born in Bethlehem, is in the book of Micah. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to go through the whole book today um, really, really quickly. And, I, and we're going to talk about the Christmas story and how, how this changes everything in our lives. And so uh, just before we go to the, the next slide in here, I, I just want to preface this with, for some of you, Christmas might not be a, a positive, wonderful time. Christmas might bring um, some sad memories. It might bring some, some difficulties. You might be aware of, okay, well, last Christmas, uh, maybe some people were there with us. And this Christmas, some people aren't. And uh, in fact, I met with, with one person uh, this week who uh, called, called me up and said, can we, can we spend a little time together? And, uh, and they, they told me Christmas is a difficult time. It, it just doesn't feel like a good time. Maybe that's some of you here, and you see the, the stockings, and you see the decorations, and you see the candy canes, and you see uh, the Christmas trees, and you see all these other things, and you see these people singing uh, joyful, uh, excited songs, and it doesn't hit you because you go, well, but I don't feel joyous right now. Where is the good news for me? Where does the love of God that we celebrate on this Sunday in Advent where does the love of God apply to my life in the midst of my darkness, in the midst of my brokenness? And, and the book of Micah tells us that the Christmas story applies exactly to us in those times. So let's, go, let's flip, flip open to the book of Micah, chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to go to the next slide. Okay. Now, Micah is broken down into three sections, just really quickly laying it out for you. Chapters 1 to 2 are the first oracle. Um... And there's a, a long section about darkness, uh, about what's going on in the land. And then there is, there's a, re a redemptive part right at the end in verses 12 to 13 that says the answer is this king that's coming. Look, look to the Messiah. Look to the delivering king. Then there's a, another oracle in chapters 3 to 5. It too lists out all kinds of things that are wrong with the world. Many things, as we'll see. Are, are the same things that we experience and, and feel anxiety about here today. And in this section, right in the middle of the book, 
Uh, God gives Micah the clearest example, the clearest description of this coming king, who he will be like, what he will do, and importantly, where he will be, bo- be born. And this is the center of the book. So we're used to, when we have something important to say uh, as English-speaking Canadians, um, I think that's most of us, um, uh, at least one of your languages is English. We've got a few other languages in the room. Um, but as, as, as Canadians, most often we think, if we have something important to say, we're going to put it right at the beginning to grab attention. Or we're going to put it right at the end so that's the last thing that people hear before we finish. Not, not so with, uh, with Hebrew thinkers. If they say something really important, they want to say it in the middle. They want to build up to it slowly. And they, then they want to say, because this is true, therefore, and they work out from there. So anything really important for them, they put in the middle. And Micah does that here in how he la- lays out his, uh, his passages. And then the, uh, the, third, uh, the third oracle is Micah chapters 6 to 7, and it goes a little bit longer into what, what we experience. And then at the end, it says that God is coming to do something really important. He's coming to take our sin away. He's coming to deal with the real problem in us and in the world. This world won't always be as it is. And in the birth of Jesus, in the manger, in Bethlehem, God is starting something. He's, he's stepping in behind enemy lines. And he is coming to rescue us. And in Jesus, we have a rescuer. We have a shepherd. We have a king. We have a hope. We experience God's love. Because of that, we know the joy of God. He has promised himself to us. And we can see that as we go through the book of Micah. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to go through... um, some of the dark things that Micah points out. Uh, this will go uh, semi-quick, but work with me uh, down, uh, starting at chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Micah of Morasheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So during this time with these kings, uh, he's prophesying at the same time as the prophet Isaiah that we looked at last week. He's uh, living around the same time as the prophet Hosea, who we haven't looked at in this series so far, but he has a very interesting story. And at the same time as they're working, he is also prophesying. There's a trio of prophets that God brings to Israel during this time. And here's here's what God sees. He sees some spiritual darkness in the area. He says, in verse 5, chapter 1, he says that he's bringing a judgment, and he says, All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? This is the capital city of Israel. And what is the high place of Judah? A high place is a place where idols are worshipped, where people go astray from God and they go after other things. After money and pleasure and comfort after uh, the promises of this world, after anything other than God. What is the high place of, Ju- of Judah? Verse 6 says, Is it not Jerusalem, the city that's meant to be the place where God is worshipped? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap in the open country and a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. And he says about this, this, this growing walk away from God, he says this has started in the north. This has started with the, the country of Israel. So there's a country of Israel in the north, country of Judah in the south, because Israel was split into two kingdoms. He said this started in Israel, the place that isn't ruled over by, by, by God's king from the line of David. He says, but it's worked its way here too. Verse 9. For his wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Maybe you, you feel like this sometimes. You look at the world. And you look at all the things that are going on and you go, wow, great. I'm, I'm, I'm at least glad that as crazy as the world is, at least those things are happening over there. We might say, hey, at least things, you know, things seem rough in maybe downtown Hamilton, but at least they're not rough over here. And then we start to see things popping up here. There's this sense that what used to be far away, what used to be in, uh, true of another group, this is happening here and we don't know how to deal with it. 
And then in the next section, verses 10 to 16, he lists a group of cities in, in Judea, in Judah. And he starts with saying, tell it not in Gath. This is from a line uh, that David used to lament over Saul and Jonathan, uh, King Saul and, and, and Jonathan, his son, when they were slayed. It's a, it's a famous line. For the people reading it, it would kick off this sense of something tragic has happened. And he goes down and he lists all these cities in, in Judah. In Bethlehem, in Shafir, in Zanan, in Bethazel, in Maroth, in Lachish, in Zion, in Achseb, all of them. He says these, these things, we're starting to see things that make us anxious. Someone asked me this week, Sean, do you notice anything different between here and, uh, and Saskatchewan? And I said, well, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think we're all pretty much the same. It's the same country. Uh, nothing's wildly different. And I, I was thinking about that a little bit more. And I thought, actually, you know, you know what? Something is different a little bit. Um, I, I noticed, for one, in Saskatchewan, uh, in the area that I was from, uh, not many people had very much. Or, or if they did, they wouldn't talk about it. If they went on a fancy trip, you know, you wouldn't mention it too much. Uh, whereas here, I mean, I, I, I walked into a conversation one time and people were, con were confer comparing their favorite things about bus uh, systems in Europe. I thought, I also have opinions about the bus system in Europe. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but at the same time, even with that being true, there's also more anxiety over the cost of living, over inflation, uh, over where is the world going? Are things going to be okay? What about these areas that used to be wide and open and spacious, and now they're closing in? What about these places that we grew up in, and now they look different? And that's a, that, that anxiety, that general anxiety about where things are going, and are we going to be okay? Even though it's a, a, a less, uh, less prosperous area out there, there's not that same anxiety here. And it hovers over everything in this area. And so when Micah talks to us and he tells us about a darkness that is felt over the land and a general sense of anxiety and that the message of Christmas is going to apply to this, well, that's a good word for us, isn't it? That even in the midst of darkness, God is not absent. Even when things seem crazy, God has a plan. Even when it seems like things that used to be far away and over there are now here. Well, God knew about that long ago, before the world began. And he knew how things were going to turn out. And God is good and he is in control. And so we can feel hope. We feel God-centered hope. Because we know the one in whom we have believed. And Micah points us to him. He says this, he says, not only are, 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 are things spiritually difficult, uh, but there's also people whose overtime work seems to be to do evil. So verse 2, he says, woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. They're, they're awake at night, they're planning, they're thinking what they will do. He says, when morning dawns, they will perform it because it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and seize them in houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house and a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I'm devising disaster. Okay. So I went to, uh, I went to, uh, um, I'm going to look at my notes here for a second. I went to a Service Ontario uh, um, uh, place because I'm working on getting my Ontario driver's license. It turns out that if I hand them one document that says Asher hyphen rice, and I hand them another document that says Asher rice, and they both have my name and my face, that's not good enough for them to, to sort things out for me. So, because <clears throat> I could be lying, right? Um, uh, <laughs> So I'm currently working through that, and I was, I was standing in line, and I saw, I saw a sign that, that read this. It said, at Service uh, Ontario, it said, did you know that a business, this is a big poster, did you know a business can affect your home's title by registering a notice of security interest against leased or rented equipment in your home, like a furnace or water heater? Ontario is exploring ways to protect consumers and homeowners against the misuse of, N of NOSIs. Help us protect you better. Give us your ideas by December 1st, 1st, 2023. So it's too late now. 
what is this? Well, I went and I looked it up on, online, and apparently there's a predatory practice where people will come door to door. They'll sell you something, a piece of equipment on a, on a, on a plan. They'll charge you way more than the appropriate price. And then uh, when, when you don't uh, pay up right away, they'll, on the phone, they'll be very forgiving. But when you go to sell your house to move to a different place, you find out that they have they filed a lien against your home, a predatory practice. And you don't find out about it until you have gotten ready to sell your place. And so that means you, uh, you're already in the process. You're already trying to move out. You're already in talks. And you don't have time to deal with um, all of this extra money that they're asking you for. And so it's just within your, within your interest in this predatory practice uh, to pay them $15,000 uh, more than you expected you were going to be paying for something because otherwise you can't sell your house. There's another uh, community here in, in Hamilton where uh, uh, a homeowners association was, was started in a, what was formerly a poorer area and people uh, moved into that area and started building up property and, and, and wealth and making the neighborhood nicer. And that seems really great and whatnot, except a, a homeowners association was, was formed and um, uh, just for little infractions against uh, the homeowners association rules, uh, letting your grass grow one inch too high, having the wrong color shade paint on your house, that kind of thing. Um, uh, there's a, a woman who received a phone call one day where she was told that she had to leave because her house has been sold. What do you mean my house has been sold? I live in this house. I'm almost done paying the mortgage, she said. Uh, this actually made its way into Bloomberg. So she, she was told that uh, their, the house their family had been living in for seven years, the house she'd never missed in a mortgage payment on, had been sold. Conversations with the city and their realtor confirmed what felt unimaginable. We realized it was actually true. Someone else owned the house. We didn't get any notices that our house was going to go into foreclosure. We would have done something to prevent all of this. It turns out that the amount that they owed to the Home Homeowners Association in unpaid tickets, because they were fighting it, was six and a half thousand dollars. For that, they were forced to have their home taken away, uh, sold, uh, without their permission. So when Micah talks about people who plan evil deeds at night to covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away, is he talking about some strange other world that doesn't exist here and now? No, he's talking about things that could be true today. And then, and then he says about, about the people in this, in this situation, in this spiritual situation, he says they, they don't want to hear anything anything. Negative. They don't want to hear anything hard. We could confront this problem spiritually. We could confront this problem as a community and do something about it, but we don't want to hear it. So in verse, seven, verse 6, it says, Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of some such things. Disgrace will overtake us. Verse 11, If a man should go about and under, utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be a preacher for this people. The problem is a big problem, not just because things are, are going wrong, but because no one wants to know what's going wrong so that they can fix it in their own lives and in their community. What, what's Micah's answer to this? Verses 12 to 13. It's, it's a God perspective. I will surely assemble all you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. Just ga God gathering all these people together.
that's, that's the background for understanding our text today, which is Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. The person that this passage tells us about is Jesus. Jesus is our king. One day, Jesus will return from his place in heaven, and on that day, the Bible says that on earth, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so this passage should make us ask a few questions. One, who are we? Two, who is our king? And three, how can we serve him? First, who are we? Micah 5, chapter chapter 5, verse 2 says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah, or you are small among the clans of Judah. God says that he he wants to bring about his promise through the tiny town of Bethlehem, not through Jerusalem, not through a a well-recognized city, not through the places that you and I would look at for signs of power. Jesus doesn't come through a significant place. He, He comes through a lowly place. He chooses what is weak to shame the strong. He chooses what's despised to show his might to the well-established and the civilized. He chooses what seems foolish to show his wisdom over all those who would claim on their own to be wise. He chooses the little town of Bethlehem. The famous Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon once said to his congregation, There are some little ones, like Bethlehem, here this morning. Little among the tribes of Judah. No one ever heard your name, did they? If you were buried and you had your name on the tombstone, it would never be noticed, Spurgeon says to his hearers. Those who pass by would say, It's nothing to me. I never knew him. Perhaps you do not know much of yourself, or think much of yourself. Or if you have some talent and ability, you're despised among men. Or if you're not despised by them, you despise yourself. You are one of the little ones. Well, he says, Christ is always born in Bethlehem among the little ones. Big hearts never get Christ inside them. Christ dwells not in great hearts, but in little ones. Mighty and proud spirits never have Jesus Christ, for he comes in at low doors, but he will not come in at high ones. He who has a broken heart and a low spirit shall have the Savior, but no one else will. He heals not the prince and the king, but the broken in heart, and he binds up their wounds. Sweet thought, Jesus is the Christ of Bethlehem. He is the Christ of the little ones. Who are we? If we are to recognize Jesus as Lord, then we first have to acknowledge that we are Bethlehem. We are chosen by God, not because of our resume, and our impressive credentials, and our good deeds, but because God is a gracious God who raises up the lowly. We come to him in need with open hands. We come to him without pride or boasting. We come to him not trying to build our own kingdom, but acknowledging his kingdom. As John Piper once put it, in the birth of Christ, God chose a stable so no innkeeper could boast. He chose the comfort of my inn. God chose a manger so that no woodworker could boast. He chose the comfort of my bed. God chose Bethlehem so no one could boast. The greatness of our city led God to choose us. And he chose you and me freely and unconditionally to stop the mouth of all human boasting. The deepest meaning of the littleness and insignificance of Bethlehem is that God does not bestow the blessings of the Messiah on the basis of our greatness or our merit or our achievement. God does not elect cities or people because of their prominence or their grandeur or their distinction. When he chooses, he chooses freely in order to magnify the glory of his own mercy. So let us say with the angels, glory to God in the highest. Not glory to us. We get the joy. He gets the glory. So who are we? We are Bethlehem graciously and freely chosen, not because we're great, but because we have a great king. Which leads us to our second question, who is our king? We read about his his identity in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. 
This king is a future king, but his origins are from ancient history. He is the promised king. He is the one spoken about to Adam and to Eve and to Noah and to Abraham and Judah and Moses and David. He is the one who will, who will reverse the damage that evil has done to the world. He is the Messiah, the Savior, God with us, God our righteousness, the root and the descendant of David, the one who is born but who was before all things, the one who possesses infinite majesty and yet had no former majesty that we should look at him, no glory that we should desire him. He is the king of the eternal promise. He is the one who is stricken for the transgression of his people and cut off from the land of the living, only to be re resurrected and to raise to life again and prolong his days. A lot of that language is taken out of Isaiah 53, which I preached from last week. Micah predicts that Jesus would be born the king of Israel, not just the ten northern tribes that call themselves Israel, but of all Israel. When we sing around Christmas time, born thy people to deliver, born a child, and yet a king, this is the one that Micah prophesies in this verse, and that we sing Christmas songs about. What is our king's identity? He is the king of the eternal promise. He is the king who has always existed eternally. He was the one who walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day in Genesis chapter 3. He is the word of God by which the world was formed in Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. In John chapter 17 verse 5, Jesus speaks of the glory that he had with, the, with God the Father before the world existed. He will be born in Bethlehem, but his coming forth is from of old, and his origins are from eternity. What is the sign of our king's arrival? Micah chapter 5, verse 2 to 3 says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. His coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. And then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. We've already read about this Messiah in the Old Testament uh, that the Old Testament predicts. We've taken a lot of specific prophecies about him and read them over the past few weeks. Every passage that we've looked at has copies that are older than the time of Jesus. Every one of them, even the one from last week, although I didn't have time to reference it, have been acknowledged by Jewish sources to be talking about the Messiah, even when it would have been tempting for them to deny it. That's true of this passage, too. An old Jewish translation of Micah chapter 5 into Aramaic reads, And you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, from you shall come forth before me the Messiah. And so they clearly thought this was talking about the promised deliverer of the Old Testament. Here Micah adds to the picture we've seen painted for us the last few weeks. Not only will the Messiah be born from the line of Abraham and Judah, and David. Not only will he be both the crusher of the serpent who suffers a fatal blow in delivering his people and yet reigns forever as the rightful holder of Judah's scepter, not only will he have significant presence around Galilee like Isaiah 9 promised, not only will he be born of a virgin and be called by the names God is with us and mighty God and God our righteousness and God our Savior like Isaiah and Jeremiah predicted, but he will be born in the town of Bethlehem. And when he comes again, he will unite his people Israel. As we ask who our king is, what is his identity, and what are the signs of his arrival, we should also ask what his character is. Read Micah chapter 4, uh, just the first part. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. He rules with the strength of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the majesty of the Lord. As we saw a couple of, the week, a couple of weeks ago, he is the Lord. He can rule in God's name and majesty and strength because Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. He is what God is. 
God and Jesus are identical. John 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, which is Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What does that mean? That means that the character of Jesus tells us two things. Number one, as a man, Jesus was the perfect representation of humanity. Although mainstream psychology can't give you any true and fast definition of normal, Christianity can. Jesus is normal. Jesus' character sets the standard for what human beings made in the image of God are meant to look like in our character. And two, there is no God in heaven who does not look like Jesus. Sometimes God can seem remote to us. We wonder, what's he really like? The answer is that the Lord is like the physical king who rules in the strength and the name and the majesty of the Lord. God is like Jesus, because Jesus is God. And so we've asked, who are we? We've asked, who is our king? The final question we should ask is, how can we serve him? In Micah chapter 5, it ends by giving this picture of who, who Jesus would be how he would reign, what kind of king he would be. It would say of, of, of those of us who serve him, who are his people, at the bottom of chapter, verse 4, it says, They will dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Jesus alone has fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. He was born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, born from the line of Abraham and Judah and David, born in Nazareth in the territory of Zebulun, and he taught and did miracles around Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee in the region of Naphtali, just like Isaiah 9 predicted. Like Isaiah 53 predicted, he was rejected by the Jewish people because he didn't fit their mold, and he died for the sins of many so they could be made righteous. And he died beside the wicked, two criminals who were crucified on either side of Jesus. And like that passage also says, he was buried in a rich man's tomb, which belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And then, as that same passage says, he mysteriously returned to life. As for his identity, he is the only one who could truly take on the titles that were predicted of him. God with us, mighty God, God our righteousness, God our salvation, He's the only one who could ever claim, or who has ever claimed, to be both the root and the shoot of David, coming from David's line, but also being the one to whom David owes, owed his very existence. He is the one who, when he next returns, will see a united Israel, and who will rule over an eternal throne over all nations, in a kingdom without end, and over an enduring, unmatched, incomprehensible peace. Because he is our peace. And so how can we serve him? I'll quote Charles Spurgeon again. And I'd encourage you to meditate on these words just a little bit as we head into Christmas. He says, My brother or sister, have you submitted to the way of Jesus? Is he ruler in your heart or is he not? We may know true Israel by this. Christ has come into their hearts to be ruler over them. Oh, says one, I do what I please. I was never in submission to any man. Oh, then you hate the rule of Christ. Oh, says another, I submit myself to my minister, to my pastor, to my priest. And I think that what he tells me is enough, for he is my ruler. Do you really think that? Oh, then you are a poor slave who does not know your dignity, for nobody is your lawful ruler but the Lord Jesus Christ. I, says another, I have professed Christ's religion, and I am his follower. I have professed Christ's religion, and I am his follower. But does he rule in your heart? Does he command your will? Does he guide your judgment? Do you continually seek counsel at his hand in your difficulties? Do you desire to honor him and to put crowns upon him in your heart? Is he your king? Blessed Lord Jesus, you are ruler in your people's hearts, and you ever shall be. We want no other king save yourself, and we will submit to none other. 
We are free because we are the servants of Christ. We are at liberty because He is our ruler. And we know no bondage and no slavery because Jesus Christ alone is King of our hearts. Let us run and submit to Christ our King. This is who He is. And this is what it means to have Him as our King. It means that we get to serve Him. And that's not a position of subjection. That's not a position of weakness. It's a position of strength. Because it means that if Christ is our King, then no one else is. If Christ is our ruler, if we belong to him, then we don't belong to anybody else, right? If Christ is the one who is Lord of our hearts, then no other person is Lord and we are completely free and he has freed us. I would rather be the subject of the Lord Jesus. I would rather be in his kingdom than in any other kingdom. I would rather be subject to his laws than any other laws. I would rather have him as my king than any other person as my king or ruler. And this is what it means to follow the words of Micah. This is what Micah was directing people towards in his day. They said, we're going to serve a new king. We're going to serve a new ruler. There were assassinations in his day. There were new people coming in claiming to be king all the time. And the nation of Israel was about to end. It went into an exile from which they still, the northern tribes, haven't returned even to this day. And he said, you won't come back. You won't come back until the return of the king that I'm telling you about. One day Jesus will return. So will those nations. So will those people. But they'll return with Jesus as their king. We have Jesus as our king right now. He is our Lord. He has done so much for us. And I just look at this and I think, what a privilege it is to serve him. You know, I've asked you, who are we? Who is our king? How do we serve him? We have the great privilege of serving a king like this. This is Jesus. This is the promised deliverer. Let's run to him. Let me pray. God, thank you that you are our king. Thank you that you call us to serve you. And that in the midst of doing that, you free us from servitude to any other. God, you free us from having to say that we belong to this or that, because we belong to you. God, help us to to be a good representative of your kingdom in our time here on earth. Help us to be good witnesses to those around us. But God, help us to realize that we are not subject to anything else. We're not subject to the whims of man. We're not subject to spiritual attack. We're not subject, we're not subject to anything but you. And so God, I just pray that you would make uh, yourself Lord of our hearts. God, that you would draw us nearer to you. That you would impress upon us the, the privilege and the joy of having you as, like this verse says, having you as our peace. And so God, I pray that you would be peace for us, that you would be joy for us, that you would be love and hope, all the things that we point to during the season of Advent, that we would find the fulfillment of those things in you because you are our King. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.